but I'm supposed to uh, be careful what I say. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Do you know what this means? This means as you're living out your life, your tongue is on a scorched earth policy. And you're attached to the fires of hell. Pretty good news, huh? That's what he's saying. Your tongue is doing a lot of damage. Strong words. He gets a little stronger. Every kind of beast and bird... A reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. I.e., as you go about your scorched earth policy, fueled by the fires of hell, there's nothing you can do about it. It's deadly poison. Have you spewed forth any deadly poison as of late? Ever? Maybe you have also received some of that deadly poison. Keeping your tongue in check. Some of us are gifted at keeping it in check better than others, right? We can go on the uh, horizontal plane here and go, well, I don't always keep my tongue in check, but I'm better than... My family was here at 9.30. I was a little hesitant to say that. At this point, I couldn't look at them and say, I was better at biting my tongue because I'm the king of not biting my tongue in my house. Can you say sarcasm? So if some of you are doing that horizontal thing and saying, at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so, here's what James says to you. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. What does this mean? Translation, if you have a tongue, you're guilty. You're guilty. Making matters worse in all of this. Our tongues participate in an irony. The same tongue that causes problems, gets us into trouble, that curses, is the same tongue that shows up here for 11 o'clock church to sing praises to God. Now, I will share one of the blessings that I have in my house that avoids trouble. I get up before anybody else does. I leave for church before anybody else is up, which is good news for me. It's easier to hold my tongue. I bet there are some of you who, as you were getting ready for church, might have some interesting conversations come out of your mouth, and on your drive into church, you walk into sanctuary, and then you start singing praises to God. And you're like, oh man, did I just say that 20 minutes ago? With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Now, it would be easy to miss this point, so I'll reiterate it. When we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Who is made in the likeness of God? Everyone. Who then should we curse? No one. Not even the bad people out there. I think we miss this. That because all people are created in the likeness and the image of God, and because God sent Jesus into the world to die for the sins of all people, that everyone deserves, everyone deserves respect. Now that's almost as challenging as love your enemies and pray for them. This... uh, Taming the tongue, this, this challenge of blessing and cursing, kind of reminds me of my second favorite chapter in the book of Romans, chapter 7. Chapter 7 of Romans talks about the struggle in the Christian life to do the things we're supposed to do and not do the things we're not supposed to do. That's the reality. 
James hits the nail on the head when talking about the tongue because many of our battles of doing that which is right and not doing that which is wrong involves our mouths in what we say. So what do we do if James is right and we're, we're setting a fire, everything around us, and we're fueled by the flames of hell and we can't tame it, what do we do? We get good news from Isaiah. It was read, the 50th chapter was read for us in our second reading, but we're going to go back to Isaiah chapter 6. It's known as the call of Isaiah, and the Lord appears to Isaiah in a vision and says, I have a task for you. And Isaiah is not thrilled about this opportunity. In fact, he freaks out. This is what he says, Woe to me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah knew the reality of his sinfulness and some of the things that came out of his mouth. And you, O oh Lord, want me to speak positive things? Good news? Who's going to listen to a trash mouth like me? So God responds by sending an angel, and this is what Isaiah says about the angel. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Isaiah, as much of a sinner as he might have been, was a forgiven sinner. And as much as we want to mythologize and, and set the biblical heroes up as heroes, they were everyday kind of folks with struggles, real struggles. And the difference was that God forgave them and then empowered them. So now Isaiah, an unclean sinner, is forgiven and empowered to speak positive words. The words of life, the story of the coming Christ. That's good news for us in part because if you fast forward to the New Testament, uh, some of our services each weekend will use some liturgical responses about confession. We don't do it here, but in some of the other ones, it's like 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, we repeat this. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. It's right out of Scripture. Basically saying, you're a liar. You're spewing forth lies if you say you're not a sinner. But if we confess our sins, if we use our tongues to say, Lord, I am sorry, God is faithful and just, and he forgives us every single time. And he removes it. And so our unclean lips are clean. Our untamed tongue is tamed. It wasn't just the magnifying glass that uh, brought back memories. These verses brought back memories because uh, you kids with the uh, soft soap have no idea. I mean, one time. Okay, maybe that's not entirely accurate. I remember specifically one time that something spewed forth from my tongue way too easily, and before it was even finished, I knew by the expression on my mom's face, Face, oops, I shouldn't have said that. And what does my mom produce? Dial. And I'm not talking about a dial, I'm talking about the bar of soap. And she said, here, put this in your mouth. I put it in my mouth. She says, oh, don't just put it in your mouth, bite it. Have you ever bitten a bar of soap? It's like gets in your teeth. And this was like, I think, before floss. So it was there for a long time. This is the good news of God removing that which is bad from our mouths without the lousy taste of soap. He forgives us. He cleanses us. This is what we get when we have confession and absolution. It is important for us as we struggle in our lives, we say what we're not supposed to say. It's important for us to go before the Lord as a community and say, I am sorry. I have done wrong, please forgive me. And then after you hear the promises of God, we're able to gather together where Jesus says, hey, 
Come, put this in your mouth. Taste it. This is my body given for you. Put this in your mouth. Drink it. This is my blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin. The miracle that Jesus provides. That's how we tame the tongue. So, maybe the third story from my childhood days, I remember very clearly my parents saying, over and over again, words that I have now spoken to my children, words that you have spoken and heard. If you have nothing nice to say, let's try that again. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. There's some truth there. Put the best construction on things, and if you can't, zip it. But it could be used as a little bit of a cop-out because it's, it, it sells short the power and the Spirit of God. The power and the Spirit of God says, not only can I put the best construction on things, but because I'm forgiven, I now have the opportunity to share the words of peace and joy and comfort and the words of eternal life, the words of encouragement for people who are so desperately in need of hearing that affirmation. And when you stumble, and you will, and when your tongue goes on fire and sets things on fire, you say, I'm sorry. But you remember that God forgives you for the opportunity not only to sing his praises, but to share the words of eternal life. So I suppose from an earthly standpoint, I, I, I could say, good luck with using your tongue today. But instead, I'll say, may the Lord bless you in the use of the tongue that he has given, forgiven that you might proclaim good things, the words of eternal life, for the sake of a world dying without Christ and to the glory of Jesus. Amen.